Thanks, Steve. This is the final uh, lecture on space weather specific topics. This one focusing on forecasting of space weather, posing the question how and how well can we predict space weather phenomena? So to begin, um, the outline is here. We're gonna talk about what a forecast is. It's not as simple as it might be thought. Uh, then we'll talk about some of the operational space weather forecasting observations and models. And this will be a US centric discussion because that's where I have most of my experience and that's where we are. Um, we'll then talk specifically about NOAA and the Space Weather Prediction Center here in Boulder and what they put out as forecasts, now casts, and reports. And we'll talk a little bit about the research to operations and operations to research feedback loop, but not much. Uh, we'll spend um, most of the last part of the lecture on forecast evaluation and how well can we actually uh, forecast space weather and how do we quantify how well we do that. <clears throat> so as a quick review, um, in order to forecast something, you generally have to have a target. And NOAA in particular has <clears throat> gone ahead and defined these scales for each of the major space weather forecast or phenomenal, phenomenological uh, categories. So recall, this is the R scale, they call it, or solar flare um, scale, R standing for radio blackout, because as you get up to the R four and five levels, you begin to really have serious, even R3, I suppose, you, you begin to have serious high frequency radio problems, uh, as we discussed a couple lectures ago. This is the NOAA S scale for SEPs or radiation. So these are the relatively rare radiation storms, again, going from one to five, um, like the earthquake scale, like the hurricane scale. Um, and finally, the geomagnetic storm scale, also going from one to five. So one begins to think that five is kind of a limit in at least NOAA classifications. But again, this is uh, um, based on more quantitative um, scales, in particular the KP scales. So keep this in mind when we're trying to forecast things. We'll talk about forecasting success in, uh, relative to the G scale of the, of the event. <clears throat> so what is a forecast? Um, it's not a prediction. And this is a plot uh, graphic designed to sort of point that out. On the flowing from left to right, uh, we uh, point out the process of producing a forecast on the top row and a prediction on the bottom is a more, more generically termed prediction. And a forecast is really something that takes observations, typically runs a model, uh, hopefully with not too many parameter knobs that you can tune to get a better forecast, um, and then produces a product, um, ideally with uncertainties attached to that product, this is often like a published probability of the event or some such other quantitative output of the, of the model. Uh, that then goes to a, a human forecaster who often tunes the product um, using expert knowledge and experience before passing that product on to an operator who makes a decision based on that specific product. Uh, in contrast, a prediction often produced by, for instance, research codes does the same thing. It either takes observations or simulated observations sometimes, feeds it into a model, typically doing case studies, trying to reproduce something that's happened in the past. Um, usually these research models will have many knobs that they can turn in terms of parameters they can adjust. They then put out a prediction of an event. Uh, often this is a yes, no. Did we predict the event to happen at its prediction? Yeah at its magnitude and its known time scale. Um, and then uh, often there's this little cheating loop here where if there's a no answer there, they go back and tune the parameter knobs again until they get it as close as possible and then they end up publishing it. So this is a very different process than an actual forecast. Uh, the primary difference here being that a forecast is actually used, hopefully, uh, 
by somebody uh, to make a decision, which may or may not have some serious impact. So the art of forecasting is what we typically refer to as trying to achieve maximum accuracy, reliability, and timeliness. And there's a nice quote here from uh, Sir Mark Walport, a UK chief science advisor. Or I, I think he's no longer in that role, but uh, he, he rightfully points out that it's a necessary but not sufficient condition for success. Uh, at the bottom, there's another quote by Tim Palmer, um, also from the UK, that there's no value in a forecast. There's only value in a, how a forecast is used. And these are very good things to keep in mind. And then in the middle here, we define what accurate or actionable can mean. Um, typically, it depends on the application. You know, How close can you get on arrival time for accuracy? How close can you get on the strength of the scale on the scale of the event? Reliable refers to the fact that it uh, typically a forecast that's that's trusted and used will have a very low false alarm rate uh, and, and we'll define that more quantitative later quantitatively later um, and this this goes to the fact that systems operators have to be able to take actions based on well-tested justifications of performance they can't if a forecast is uh, ha does has a, a high false alarm rate they can't really take serious consequential actions like changing the power grid or altering a flight path uh, based on a high false alarm rate forecast. And then timely, again, is it's usually as soon as possible, but this means you have to be able to assess the observations, run those models as shown in the previous pathway uh, relatively fast in order to deliver the forecast um, before something happens. Um, and there's a difference here between forecasts and products. And the key thing is that products are what are put out to the public, uh, the, the end user, the consumer. Um, typically, they're not going to be looking at model output. They're going to be looking at products based on model output. And there's three products we talk about in the forecasting business. One is a watch. And this is basically put out when something has happened and been detected but may or may not cause an event. And the classic issue, uh, classic example in uh, space weather is a CME. So generally a watch is issued on the basis of observation that is consistently known to cause events, like a CME leaving the sun roughly in the direction of the earth or a large coronal hole rotating into the sun earth line. Uh, a watch is not a definitive prediction of an occurrence. It's only stating the possibility of an occurrence. It's sort of telling people to get ready for more information. And the threshold of, for issuance of a watch is pretty subjective. You know, a forecaster looks at the CME and sees if it's earth directed, uh, if it's a halo CME, for instance, and then issues a watch based on that. In contrast, a warning is that something has been detected or predicted and will very likely cause an event. So generally this is issued on the detection of event at an upstream location. For instance, in space weather, the detection of a shock at the L1 Lagrangian point. And a warning usually comes with a forecasted magnitude. For instance, a G3 warning will be put out for a geomagnetic storm, a strong geomagnetic storm. But often this magnitude is updated as conditions or measurements change. And finally, an alert is an event in progress. And this is based on measured levels of activity at the location of interest. Uh, for instance, ground-based magnetometers on the earth will start showing activity and an alert will be put out for um, you know, a geomagnetic storm. And this is also the initial provisional, I should say, statement of the timing and magnitude of event and may be refined after the fact. So current space weather capability in terms of watch warnings and alerts is shown here uh, for each of the major uh, phenomenological scales we showed earlier, R, S, and G. Um, although, as I like to point out, we should really call these eruptions and not flares. But in any case, the, the glaring uh, gap here is that there's no such thing as a watch or a warning for a, an eruption yet. There's only an alert based on passing the M1 level on the X-ray threshold. So forecasters will literally sit there in the forecast office and watch those X-ray curves start to go up. And they can do this as because, uh, because, as I'll point out later, they have three second latency on these products. So they're really looking at x-rays in real time. Uh, in contrast to radiation storm, uh, we can put out warnings for those. And typically that's put out 15 to 30 minutes before the things hit. And that's based on the eruption, uh, typically based on the magnitude of the flare associated with the eruption. So as soon as they 
forecasts are seeing an eruption with a large flare in the right place on the disk, they can put out a, a radiation storm warning, uh, and then they can place an alert uh, out when the GOES uh, X-ray or GOES SICE instruments rather uh, detect those protons at Earth. And then finally, the geomagnetic storm is really the only phenomenon where we have all three watch, warning, and alert products um, currently being put out by uh, forecasting offices. And the watches, as I mentioned, put out when they see a CME that's looking earth directed. They can also put out, um, uh, oh, they cannot put out watches on high speed streams and CIR events, even though they can see a coronal hole rotating across the disk. They're just not certain enough about whether or not that coronal hole high speed stream is gonna be geo effective. And so they only really issue warnings on high speed streams and CIRs once the stream hits uh, the Discover satellite at L1, for instance. And then they can also warn on CME arrivals at L1. And finally, they put out the alert, as I mentioned, once the ground-based magnetometers or the GOES magnetometer uh, in, in geo orbit starts to go um, berserk. So this is a nice chart to compare space weather forecasting to other types of forecasting that go on meteorological or um, geophysical. And it, it, se it segregates the, the time domain of events into the um, you know, pre-event time frame of the, where you might wanna issue a warning versus the duration of the event uh, where you are supposed to be issuing now casting as to what's exactly happening. And uh, as you can see here, Earthquakes are kind of unique in that we really still don't have any precursor events. Um, and then solar eruptions are also another one where uh, we don't really have a precursor that we can put out reliable, accurate hours to minutes types of warnings. We can you know, put out probabilities of solar eruptions as we'll see later, but they're not very good. And certainly we can't do days in advance uh, warnings for flares slash uh, eruptions. People want that. They off, you'll often hear from airline uh, schedulers, for, for instance, that they'd like to know 72 hours in advance if there's gonna be a radiation storm, um, but we just can't do that. The turnover time scale for active regions is on the order of a day. So um, there's, it's, it's really, things change so quickly that saying something's definitively gonna happen with good accuracy and low false alarm rate over 24 hours is, is really, uh, not possible. And you'll see the skill scores for that reflect that. Um, so in contrast, what is a now cast? A now cast is what's happening at the moment of the product when you put it out. So an alert comes out and often a now cast will then also include specifications of current conditions relative to a particular operation or event. For example, the 10 MeV proton flux at GEO during a solar energetic particle event will, will be continually updated by SWPSI the X-ray irradiance during a flare, or the rate of TEC index change over a given location, et cetera. So again, this requires low latency, real-time observations. Um, latency requirements vary by mission, but are typically on the order of seconds or minutes. So to put out a good nowcast, you can't wait three, six, nine hours for your data to come down from the satellite. Uh, as an example, as I mentioned, the GOES X-ray satellite and the proton flux come down with a three second latency from the satellite to the ground station. So this, the measurements are taken and within three seconds, um, forecasters are looking at them in, in, on, the, on the screen. Related to this is uh, the all clear announcement. Um, this is typically described as an official statement of event termination and return to safe conditions. These don't really exist, um, particularly in space weather forecasting. Um, a lot of people think they should. Um, there is an all clear that the um, Space Radiation Group at NASA Johnson will in, issue to the ISS astronauts, um, letting them know they, they think it's safe to go back um, to activities without uh, danger of radiation. But otherwise, there, NOAA SWPSI, for instance, doesn't put out any, any of these. And typically that's because legal liability is a major issue and for instance, if they told airlines, it's all clear, you can go ahead and fly over the poles again, and another radiation storm occurred, um, that would be a bad thing. So all clear is a pretty rare uh, element. So the value of now casting, as we saw earlier, when we looked at the 1967 event, 
uh, was well proven when um, the BMUs operators up in Alaska began receiving very strange signals and thought that perhaps, in fact, the initial interpretation was that the Russians were jamming the radars in preparation for a nuclear strike. Uh, luckily, now casting for solar um, flares was available even back in 67, and the space weather forecasters were able to issue uh, an alert to these guys and say, this, there's a solar flare going on right now. It has a very high solar radio flux, so uh, it's not the Russians. And that was obviously very helpful. Uh, the flow that we'll get into now of, of what a, a forecast and nowcast process looks like is the following. We saw a little bit about this before, but this in, this in particular points out that products are always a part of it. You go from observations to models to products, and then you put those out to customers who make uh, in their own decisions based on their own impact-based decision tools. And so models in this context can be complex, multi-input empirical or physics-based models. Increasingly, they're looking like they're gonna be machine learning uh, prediction models. And then products, as we saw, are watches, warnings, alerts, now casting data, et cetera. So let's look at the observations first. This is the NOAA operational space weather observations um, suite, and weather observation suite actually, including space weather. And uh, what do we mean by operational? Again, that means the data come down immediately. There's no latency or if the latency exists, it's measured in seconds. And so you really can't call anything else observation operational uh, except something that gets to the forecast office within seconds. Um, and we see on this plot that there are some specific space weather observations made by NOAA, and in particular the Discover satellite out at L1, looking at solar wind velocity, density, temperature, and, and interplanetary magnetic field. <coughs> There's also the GOES satellites in geo orbit, which do solar X ray and EUV irradiance measurements, and also solar EUV imaging, and also um, geos geospace magnetic field, and also energetic particles. And we also point out the POES, which are um, NOAA's civil um, weather satellites in polar orbits in LEO. And the US Air Force, now Space Force, also operates the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program satellites in LEO. Both of those have uh, magnetometers and energetic particle sensors. Uh, unfortunately, both have been canceled and are going away. Uh, the POES capabilities have been replaced by the JPSS capabilities shown on the right there for polar orbiting uh, sat weather satellites. Uh, but unfortunately, they chose not to put space weather instrumentation on those for some reasons which remain completely mysterious. Um, it's also worth noting from a weather standpoint that these uh, polar orbiting satellites are much more important for your weather forecast than GOES. Everybody thinks GOES is big for the weather forecasting because it takes the pictures of the Earth and shows the clouds and everything. Uh, it's not the case. GOES is really more of a now casting capability. Uh, POSE and JPSS are the main uh, inputs through microwave scanning of the depth of the atmosphere for precipitation, uh, water content, and also upper level winds that go into really driving your forecasting models. So just a little aside there on weather forecasting. Um, the U.S. Space Force, previously Air Force, now Space Force, does have their own operational space weather uh, observations. That, as I mentioned, they have the DMSP program, unfortunately terminating. Uh, they run the HASDEM calibration. This is the high accuracy, set, high accuracy satellite drag model calibration objects. So there's, they, they track 70 to 100 objects in orbit very carefully and put those into a drag model. That's not really an observation system that they made, it's they use their radars and track uh, satellites that they know the uh, shape of and they also track debris. Um, they also run the Solar Optical Observation Network or SOON network. This is a network of H-alpha telescopes, one of which is shown at Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque there on the bottom. And then they also run the Solar and Electro-Optic Network, which is H-alpha uh, full sun imaging and solar radio monitoring. Um, I don't know that they have H-alpha sun imaging on the, with the Sion network anymore. I think it's just the radio telescopes. Uh, one is shown on the far right there, the Sagamore Hill base in Massachusetts. Those are very old dishes. They're 
very much at the end of their life. I think there, there's one technician now in, in taking care of the entire network. Uh, so those really need to be replaced because it's our only radio burst um, for now casting capability. Uh, NOAA doesn't really have radio telescopes they run to tell us whether there's a radio burst with an, associated with a particular uh, eruption. And then finally, the Air Force also runs the Sendin network, which is a network for uh, of GPS monitors looking at scintillation, particularly in the equatorial uh, regions. Uh, NASA, even though they're not an operational uh, agency like the D DOD or NOAA, does run some um, space missions that are used in forecasting space weather, and I've circled them here in orange. Um, NASA does like to get a little bit carried away and, and state that a lot of other missions they run are being used for space weather forecasting or now casting. And again, because these are not operational, low latency um, backed up systems, they really aren't operational and the forecasters really can't use them. The one that is very close to being operational is SDO because it has a dedicated antenna. It's up at geospace or geosynchronous orbit, a dedicated antenna at White Sands. So there really is 24 seven data coming down from SDO. And the gold mission also has 24 seven data coming down because it's on a commercial communication satellite. All of the other satellites you see here have latency issues, ACE, SOHO, STEREO. Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter have almost zero utility for space weather forecasting because of huge data latencies. Um, nevertheless, they're often cited as space weather uh, missions by NASA. Okay, um, there are also some ground-based networks run by civilian agencies. The United States Geological Service runs the magnetometer networks that detect geomagnetic storms. The US Coast Guard runs a very extensive GPS network called the CORS network, which is used uh, by SWPSI to incorporate ionospheric total electron content data into some of their now casting, model, um, now casting products and some maybe forecasting products in the future. The International GPS System, IGS, I forget what that stands for exactly, runs another GPS network that's worldwide. Uh, the National Science Foundation funds the Global Oscill Oscillations Network Group, which is run by the National Solar Observatory out of Boulder here. This is a system of six magnet magnetograms and H-alpha imagers around the world. And then finally, there's a neutron monitor network uh, recently uh, reinvigorated in the U.S. anyway by the NSF, uh, which is key in detecting the highest energy SEP events and then backing out the energies that occurred at aviation altitudes. So not so much for now casting, but sort of post casting, at least to tell people this is how much radiation you got on your flight from Chicago to Beijing. So useful. Post casting is something we didn't mention above, but it is useful to, to tell people this is what happened to you. Um, Civil aviation space models, switching gears to the models now that go, to, go into making a forecast. This is a, uh, a, a sort of an overview of all of NOAA's models and notice that they take kind of a sun to mud approach uh, built because they were a research outfit before they were a forecasting outfit. Um, and so they go all the way from solar wind uh, running the WSA model to solar wind in the heliosphere running the Inlil model to magnetospheric models and all the way down to the ground where they run um, electric geoelectric field models in concert with the USGS again. Uh, in contrast, the DOD has much more mission specific models that they run. This is an overview of their models and products. And you can see that they're concentrated primarily on communications and orbital hazards. So uh, on the left, uh, there's a geo radiation hazard for their geosynchronous satellites. There's the wing KP model that they run for geomagnetic disturbances uh, on the ground, which is you know, one of the few sort of general things they, they run. Otherwise, again, it's very concentrated on their mission. The magnetosphere auroral location is so that they know if there's uh, communications issues in the Arctic. They do have a full physics ionosphere model called the game model that they run, and that does assimilate some data. And so it's a, uh, that, that is a data assimilative full physics model. However, it does not have the thermosphere or the lower atmosphere in, uh, integrated, so it's not as accurate as the NOAA models um, that we'll uh, 
And do I have a slide on the NOAA model? No, I don't. But the NOAA thermosphere ionosphere model is a full physics and fully coupled model with the lower atmosphere. Uh, and you can see here, they, they focus on some communications things. And then on the far lower right, I show the thermosphere has to model again. So this is a uh, density in low earth orbit, which is again, data assimilative. They have satellite uh, tracking that they use. They track 75 to 100 objects up there and correct the density in real time. Okay, so moving on to products, this is a the, the list shown here of forecasts and, and reports from NOAA, you can get it at that website. The most important one that I, I or the most useful one that I, I think of when I, when I wanna look at these is the report and forecast of solar and geophysical activity. So that has everything, it starts, and, and I kid you not, NOAA still puts out courier font reports <laughs> that look like they were straight out of a teletype machine even though it's now web-based, but this is exactly what they still look like. Um, so they start with solar activity and they'll tell you about all the regions on the disk that have been uh, creating activity. Note that they, for some reason, again, completely unknown reason, subtract 10,000 from the region number. So other sources will show this as active region 12860, but NOAA will only give you the last four digits, um, whatever. Uh, then they'll show you what the activity over the previous 24 hours was starting in the one hour prior, prior to the issue of this product. And then they'll give you the forecast for the next um, 72 hours in a very heuristic uh, sort of way. They won't talk about magnitudes, just you know, very low to high solar activity kind of forecasting. They also then give you geophysical activity, again, over the same 24 hour prior period. Uh, and then they'll give you a forecast for the next 72 hours. And they'll use this funny language, again, not really specifying on their G scale for some reason, but you'll see stuff like unsettled to major storm levels. Um, this is not widely used. It's kind of adapted from um, terrestrial weather where you'll, you're, you'll hear about unsettled or stormy conditions, um, but they still use it in these teletype reports. Uh, finally, they'll, they'll give you some event probabilities, M-class and X-class flare probabilities and proton or SEP event probabilities. This is because customers generally want this instead of, they don't really wanna hear that there's gonna be unsettled space weather conditions. They, they want the pro probabilities of what's actually gonna happen. Uh, PCAF there is something, I don't know, we talked much about, it's called, it's an acronym for polar cap absorption forecast and they give it in a stoplight um, uh, scale, red, yellow, green. It's kind of equivalent to the DOD's uh, polar Arctic uh, auroral forecast location we saw earlier. They'll also uh, talk about the 10 centimeter flux, which is, a, as we noted, an EUV proxy. And then they'll give you the um, previous 24 hours geomagnetic A indices instead of KP indices. For some reason, they go A there, KP on their G scale. But anyway. Looking now at the process of how you go from those sorts of data models and things to actually putting out a forecast. This is the current operational flare forecasting process. And you'll notice it's dominated by human in the loop processes. So how do they get to those probabilities shown in the upper right there again? Well, what they do is they go from a gong magnetic field and soon sunspot imagery shown on the far left to classifying a given active region on, for NOAA, the Macintosh uh, sunspot classification scale. We'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. But having classified the sunspot into this uh, particular classification system, they then look it up. Uh, they then take that classification and look up what the historical flaring activity is. That's shown on the plot in the middle lower region there. And you can see for a particular, in this case, the uh, class D sunspot groups, the M and X class flaring probabilities are noted um, based on historical sort of two or three solar cycles worth of data. Um, and that's literally what they start with for their probability. And then they modify it by looking, so that's the climatology lookup table that I mentioned there in the bullet points in the middle. But the forecaster will modify that probability based on the growth or decay of the active region you know, how fast is it growing or how fast is it decaying? Because growing active regions flare more than decaying. Uh, 
They'll also modify it by total area of the active region, flaring history comes into it, and then just sort of a, you know, expertise kind of experiential um, tweaking of the forecast usually goes on to produce, as shown on the far right, um, probability of flaring in the next n hours, where currently n is 24, 48, and 72. Although, as I mentioned, 48 and 72 should probably just be dropped. There's no real skill there. Okay, this is the Macintosh system, the based on the Zurich system, uh, which started back in the 19th century. But it takes this A, B, C, D, E, F, and H, I don't know what happened to G, but um, H uh, classification, and then modifies it with how big the penumbra is uh, with the middle designation. And then finally, what is in between the sunspot systems, if anything, uh, of a given active region. And you come out with this three letter classification um, called the Macintosh classification, which again then goes into those lookup tables I showed earlier and gives you a flaring probability over time. So for instance, uh, E and F are the two most complex regions. And so EKC and FKC will be your most flare productive uh, classifications. So when you see those sorts of classifications on a given report, you know that's a potentially flaring active region. Now there's another one that's out there in, in particularly in Europe, you'll see uh, the Mount Wilson magnetic field based classification you used and this again is based on not just the sunspot appearance like the Macintosh system, but on the actual magnetic field characteristics. So um, alpha is a unipolar sunspot, but beta is uh, bipolar sunspots. So you have to have a magnetogram again to decide if it's a beta uh, system. Gamma is a complex mix of polarities in the same active region and then delta is this sort of rare, but um, all, always very active, in, indicative of, of high activity, uh, opposite polarity umbra within a, another penumbral area. And basically that usually just means that two opposite polarity sunspots have collided, not that some, something has popped up in the middle of a sunspot, for instance. So any, uh, a delta system is really a collision of sunspots of opposite polarity, but that is always gonna imply a very high shear opposite polarity shear zone, which as we saw in earlier lectures, is always indicative of high flaring uh, activity. So in, in this case, beta, gamma, delta is your boogeyman sunspot um, uh, configuration that often ends up in, in large flaring conditions. So what do they do um, to do better than just say something's gonna flare? This is the WSA inlow model which is a complex chain of model act models actually, which is how they predict uh, solar wind speed at earth and also CME arrival time. So the observations are shown in the brown box on the left, you have your gong synoptic magnetogram. We'll talk about what that is in a minute. You also have the LASCO coronagraph that we've seen is how you spot CMEs coming off the sun. Those are fed into a coronal field model, the WSA model in this case, which gives wind out at 21.5 solar radii, which is then fed into this Enlil MHD model. So the models are in the blue box. And the process flow is shown there where the forecaster gets the output of these models. Um, the forecaster also has to work with what's called the Swipsy CAT tool or the CME. Uh, what does CAT stand for? I forget what CAT stands for, but it's basically looking at the CME is from as from as many directions as possible in this case from uh, stereo A and from LASCO. So you see two different views of the same CME and you use that to uh, parameterize the angle of the CME, the size of the CME, the directionality of the CME. And that tool goes into the Enlil uh, hydrodynamic CME simulation, which then propagates out to give you arrival time at earth. And these are then go, again, go into products, the geomagnetic storm watch, for instance, the three day KP forecast, which eventually gets looked at by, for instance, power grid operators. Uh, what is a mag synoptic magnetogram? Again, this is this funny product where you need a global model of the sun to make a good uh, prediction of the global magnetic field, but we don't get a global view of the sun. We just get one disk from earth typically. Uh, and so this shows how you connect uh, meridional observations of the magnetogram over time 
and sort of stack these stripes together over time to give you a full sun, quote unquote, view of the magnetic field. Now note that uh, the sun is constantly changing so that this is a completely fictional construct. Uh, by the time you're done, it's a 27 day old map on the far left or far right of the map. Uh, and also you can't really observe the poles very well at all. Those, a lot of the, the polar regions are basically extrapolated uh, from very noisy data typically. So the poles are terrible in these things. And it's a, it's a very old map by the time you start using it to, to create your global models of the magnetic field. This is the primary reason that solar wind forecasting is as unskillful as it is these days. And it's the primary reason that CME uh, arrival time forecasts are also off by an average of 10 hours uh, minimum. They're often off by 30 or 40 hours, but the average over time is about plus or minus 10 hours. So when you're all done with that, what you do get, however, is a, a relatively interesting model of CMEs coming off of the sun. This was the famous 2017 September events. And I'll go ahead and play that again. You can see this hydromagnetic, meaning there's no magnetic field within the CME of Enlil, but it does have a pretty good shape, structure, and speed, hopefully, which shows in the top row the plasma density, in the bottom row the radial velocity, and these plots show when they expect it to arrive at Earth as a function of time. So this is, a, this is September 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and you can see that CME on the 6th was predicted to arrive on the 7th. Um, this one they got fairly well, I think it was fairly well predicted within uh, six hours or so, because it was a major CME uh, erupting directly at the Earth. So those are, um, with stereo A back here, giving you a good angular uh, view of it, um, those are usually fairly well predicted. When you lose your stereo A or, and stereo B views and you just have straight on L1 halo CME views, it gets much more difficult to get that accurate. Um, this is just a plug for our own work here at Space Weather Trek. Uh, Greg Lucas um, noticed that this the Enlil M MHD model is actually a 3D volumetric simulation. So why are the heck are we still looking at this thing in these 2D slices? And he went ahead and created this 3D viewer, which shows CMEs coming out in 3D and is somewhat more useful for the forecasters to uh, predict if and when a CME is gonna hit. And the uh, URL is down here. Uh, you can go to that URL and uh, you have to register for server purposes. Um, but other than that, it's a free tool that you can use to play around with. 3D CD, CME um, visualizations. And it's being evaluated right now by the UK Met Office uh, Space Weather Forecasting Group, as well as SWPC and CCMC here in the US for uh, implementation into operations. Okay, so the timing of these things again is the geomagnetic storm watch is issued upon seeing something in Alaska. Uh, this is typically 15 to 60 hours before the Earth impact, if anything. Uh, that goes into uh, the Enlil model to refine the arrival time. Geomagnetic storm warning is issued upon detection of the CME shock, shock wave at Discover or ACE at the L1 Lagrangian point. This gives us anywhere from 15 to 60 minutes before the CME Im impacts. And then finally, the alert is uh, issued upon uh, detection of the CME, uh, detection of the geomagnetic storm rather, uh, kicking off on the ground-based magnetometers. Uh, another one that's interesting to talk about is the operational auroral visibility forecast from SWPSI. This is the Ovation Prime model. So it's based on observations, again, of the solar wind up at L1, and they drive a particle precipitation model off of just those data to try and give you an idea of where on the, um, on the uh, Earth the auroral oval is going to fall. So the Ovation Prime is the model, and then a web display called the Ovation Prime web display is put out on, on the SWPSI website. And you can go to the, to the URL shown in the bottom left there. Uh, and it gives you a, a rough idea of the auroral oval. It certainly doesn't have the structure of the actual aurora due to substorm magnetic field dynamics, for instance, but it gives you a rough idea of where you should be able to see a, the aurora for any given geomagnetic conditions. And it is worth pointing out that this is the number one use of the SWPSI website. Um, far outpacing any of the other geomagnetic or flare uh, 
products uh, because a rural tourists want to know if and when they're going to be able to see if and when and where they're going to be able to see the aurora for any given night. So that's by far and away the biggest use of the SWIPSI website. Okay, finally, we're going to talk a little bit about how you evaluate a forecast and how well we can do at that. Um, so there are two main types of forecasts issued in weather and space weather or lots of different events. One is the event-based or what we call binary categorical forecast. This is simply will an event happen or won't it happen? So it's a, again, a yes or no uh, uh, classification. And the second is probabilistic forecasts, which give you uh, quantitative uh, information on what is the likelihood that an event will occur. <clears throat> so first to the binary categorical forecast, it's in some ways simpler, but uh, in other ways it can get devilishly complicated with what you do with what's called the truth table or contingency table. And that's this table shown in the upper left where you have basically the observed and forecast um, results for a given event. And there's positive or negative, did it happen? or did it not? Did you forecast it to happen or did you not forecast it? Or did you forecast it to not happen? And you can see, we just have four numbers there, A, B, C, and D, also known as hit or true positive, miss, false negative, false alarm or false positive or null or true negative events. And um, the total number of events for any given um, period of examination is just the sum of those four numbers. But from those four numbers alone, you can have an enormous number of different ways of looking at um, the success of a given forecast. And I list some of the more common ones on, on the table on the left there, uh, everywhere from precision to recall to accuracy. We have false positive rates, things called specificity. <clears throat> And then something called the true skill statistic that we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, things to note here that are important in forecasting are the true positive rate. In other words, also called the recall, probability of detection or sensitivity. So there's lots of different terminology out there. It's, as soon as you start reading forecast literature, it's really confusing. And a table like this is very useful because everybody calls their, their performance metrics something different, it seems. But uh, recall is basically how often did you forecast a positive uh, event to occur versus how often did it happen? Um, so A plus B is how often something happened. And A is the uh, forecast, your forecast of uh, something that you think is going to happen. And then the false positive rate in, in contrast is how often did you blow it? Um, how often did you forecast something to happen, but it didn't happen? So the negative rate of occurrence is C plus D, and the false positive rate, you know, or false, um, false, sometimes called the false alarm rate, as distinct from the false alarm ratio. Again, this is crazy, but that's that's the way it is out there. Um, and that is C over C plus D. So there's lots of different things here, and they're all when you really dig into them, they have different sensitivities to the imbalance of the events. For instance, how often is something positive or something negative? <clears throat> and what is the climatology of those, of those ratios? So again, this is just on that one table of four numbers. You can get really complicated as to what you, uh, how you base the skill of a given forecast. And these are some of the skill tests uh, that are out there. The skill is always based on your, your sort of um, number correct minus some reference forecast, which I show as S2 here, divided by uh, two other, you know, another reference forecast minus the reference forecast that you're um, basing it off of. So again, usually S on your part is that how often did you get true positive plus true negative, correct? And then you can base that, uh, you can um, reference that to the perfect forecast, the false forecast, the random forecast, or the unskilled forecast. And all of those S's there have their own A plus B plus C plus D sorts of um, uh, formulas. And then the ratio test is shown there, which is basically A plus D over N. Um, 
which is also accuracy. Um, but two of the ones that come up the most often for events like solar flaring, which are relatively ep rare episodic events, are the Heidecke skill score and the Hansen and Kuiper skill score or the true skill statistic as we showed on the previous page. So TSS goes from zero to one, zero is totally unskilled, one is a perfect forecast. The Heidecke skill score goes all the way from negative infinity to one, um, sometimes two, depending on, there's something out there called HSS2. Um, but again, those are kind of asides. And then some of the reference forecasts, you'll hear about a climatology forecast. This is just basically predicting something based on the average over a long time period. So that's those flare tables I showed you earlier from the Macintosh paper, that's climatology forecasting. Persistence forecasting is just uh, forecasting that things will stay as they are right now. So if there's no flare happening now, that's the way it will stay. And this is also interesting, inter interestingly, a very accurate forecast because flares are so rare. Uh, if you forecast that a flare is not gonna happen, you're gonna be right well over 90% of the time. And you're gonna, that's gonna beat the accuracy of the actual flare forecasting where you're trying to tell people whether or not something meaningful is happening. But also note that uh, if you forecast nothing's gonna happen all the time, you may be very accurate, but that's completely useless. So nobody's gonna pay attention to you, obviously. And then finally, recurrence forecast is something that you know is gonna happen again and again. The classic example in space weather here is the, the high-speed streams from sol uh, coronal holes. The 27-day ro rotation rate of the sun means that you can pretty much forecast a coronal hole high-speed stream to recur in 27 days, and you'll be pretty accurate. Uh, okay, so now how, how well do they do over at SWPSI? Well, this is the um, government required reports they put out every once in a while. Uh, this is a, they haven't put out one in a while. This is information up to 2013. I can't find any more re recent information on their website. They probably have it hidden somewhere uh, deep in the bowels of their government archives. But anyway, looking at the 2012-2013 period, this is their contingency table for uh, G1 to G5 geomagnetic storms. And really, how did they get a contingency table on, the, on a range? Well, what they did is they said, uh, we consider anything, if we forecast anything G1 or above um, and something happened, that's an event. So it's really squashing that whole G1 to G5 table down into a yes, no, did something over G1 occur or not? And you can see here, um, there's, uh, this is indicative of the imbalance that we, that we typically see. There's 33 positive events and 492 negative um, events or you know, forecasting true negatives. And you can see the mix of events here gives them a, an accuracy of 88%. But if they had just done, gone with climatology again, they would have uh, achieved an accuracy of 94%. The true skill statistic here, as shown in the bottom middle, is 33%, which isn't too terrible, but obviously it's not above 50% where you'd like, like to be dwelling. Um, so yeah, that's, that's geomagnetic forecasting skill as it is today. Um, if you want to look at probabilistic six forecast success, you have to look at the Breyer skill score. And this was discussed in the paper uh, by Crown. Um, and the formula there is shown where you're basically subtracting the observed frequency of an event against the forecast probability of an event and summing it up, squaring the difference, summing it up and uh, taking the average. So the skill scores for solar eruption probability skill, in other words, solar flare prediction skill are pretty low, um, but they're not zero. So and interestingly enough, they show that the Breyer skill score for the 24 hour flare forecasting is 0.132. Uh, obviously zero is better here because you're closer to the observed frequency. And as they go out in time, it, it improves, meaning that they're probably just uh, forecasting nothing happening in 72 hours most often. And lo and behold, you know, that's usually right. So really the number to pay attention to is, here is the 24 hour Breyer skill score. <clears throat> And that's showing that they're, um, it's low, but it's significantly off zero. Uh, this is also only for M flares and above. On the right, I show what's called a reliability curve, where you plot the observed relative frequency against the forecast relative frequency. And you can see that in general, 
they overpredict flares um, in in this period. This is a pretty wide period. This is 1986 to 2013 for M flares only, and it's I think it's only the, the 24 hour M flare curve. So it's pretty good. An ideal forecast would hit right along the 45 degree line, of course, uh, but they overpredict um, somewhat. Another way to look at these things and quantify them is called the receiver operating characteristic curve or the rock curve. This is taken from signal processing. And here you're plotting the probability of detection or the hit rate against the false alarm rate. Uh, if you fell along the diagonal line, you'd have no skill at all. In other words, you'd have just as many false alarms as hits. Again, this is why false alarms are bad. Uh, you want to you want to follow that red curve ideally, where you have no false alarms and only total success rate, uh, total a hit rate of one. But you can't do that. In reality, you have to change your probability threshold, as shown, and see what you get. And so you can see here is that as you change your probability for flaring, if you had a five percent threshold as this curve showed, you'd be predicting flares all the time, uh, and you'd have, you'd have a pretty good um, hit rate, but you'd also have a high false alarm rate as you adjust the curve, trying to get towards that red sort of binary uh, plot. It looks like you'd probably want to go with something around a 0.55 to 0.45 threshold to get the maximum area underneath that blue curve. So the area under the curve or the AUC is often what we use to detect um, skill in a probabilistic forecast like this. <clears throat> and here are the rock curves for Swipsy's official, again, just 2013 data available apparently right now um, for um, M flares and X flares and proton events. And you can see M flares, um, okay, not so great. Uh, X flares looking a little better, but that's because part of the reason is because they have so few. Uh, and in particular with the proton forecasts, you can see there's very few. And so you have a pretty limited ability to use the rock curve to get an actual uh, forecast skill metric here. Um, this is the contingency table work taken out of the crown paper that we had for this week. And it's interesting because first of all, a, a good thing to point out is that <clears throat> contingency tables are a must have when you're publishing any kind of metrical evaluation. Uh, and so, Kudos to Misty Crown and, and co-authors for doing that. Here is the contingency table for X-ray flare class, uh, by X-ray flare class rather, C class, M class, and X class. So you can go and just using these numbers, these four key numbers for each of these classes, you can dig out everything we showed earlier. And you, so you get to pick, when you get this kind of data, you get to pick what metric you, you wanna use. Uh, and here it is. Um, this is for the lookup table for just using the Macintosh lookup tables that I showed earlier. This is for subjective forecast probabilities uh, turned into binary uh, event probability or binary categorical forecast output. This is when the forecaster uses their own subjective um, alteration of the lookup tables to produce a flare forecast. Um, and you can see in general, the, they do better than the, uh, a subjective forecast does better than the lookup table forecast. So if we look here, at, for instance, the Heidecke skill score, the subjective is always gonna be significantly higher than the lookup table for any of these flare classes. Um, and this gives you a good idea of where they're, they're sitting for, the, for Heidecke skill scores for various flares. And it's around 50%, <clears throat> which is good. And it turns out that if you look up um, the paper that I referenced earlier by Leka et al., which compares this to machine learning and other uh, automated flare forecasting, uh, nobody has really beaten this. So currently there are no um, automated flare forecasting systems which can do better than the subjective human in the loop flare forecasting. So it's kind of like where image recognition was relative to machine learning, um, say, 10 years ago before the advent of deep CNNs, which now can uh, basically kick our butts. We're not there yet with flare uh, forecasting, however. And then finally, the Briar skill score. Um, 
table from, again, from Crown et al. Again, you wanna get down towards zero, <clears throat> zero is better. For the less complex regions, <clears throat> they actually do better than for the more complex regions, which is a little odd because more complexity usually means you have more information to see if something's going to flare. Uh, but the bottom line here is that for M and X class flares, and those are the only ones that really matter, of course, uh, forecast skill decreases with increasing magnetic complexity. This is likely due to over forecasting. The over forecasting bias we saw on the previous slide, if you look here in the bias column, <clears throat> anything over one means that you're over forecasting. Uh, and for the X flares, uh, they're still over forecasting to about, you know, on a 1.1 something like a 1.1 bias score. The lookup tables are really biased. Uh, forecasters do a little bit better to cut down that bias, but still I think that's why you see when they go to the more complex regions, they're still over forecasting and getting these fairly high um, uh, binary skill scores, prior skill scores rather. So that I believe is it. Um, this one, finished with a few minutes for questions. Uh, next week's reading is listed there. So you get these PDFs and you can uh, look at the solar stellar connection paper uh, for next week. But uh, I guess it's a good time to take any questions uh, if, there, if there are any.